The Titanic disaster has propagated a lot of myths over the years. And some of these are just outright lies, and some are just half-truths. And this is certainly true when it comes to the number of lifeboats that the Titanic carried. Everybody knows the story. Titanic was carrying boats enough for less than half of the total of the ship's complement, and on the night of the sinking, the predominant cause for the massive death toll was the fact that not enough people could find space in a lifeboat. But is this really true? Why did Titanic only carry 20 boats? Why were so many launched not full? And did the ship really not have enough? Well, the answers may surprise you, so let's take a look. To understand the myths surrounding Titanic's lifeboats, we need to go all the way back to the earliest stages of the ship's design. Harland and Wolfe, Titanic's builders, had been partnered with White Starline for decades since the 1860s, building and launching some of the world's finest ships. By 1909, the companies had introduced ocean liners of dramatically increasing size. In 1899, the company's largest ship was the Oceanic, about 704 feet long and 17,200 gross registered tons. And just five years later, in 1904, it was Baltic, almost 24,000 tons and 730 feet long. The size and capacity of ships was just getting bigger and bigger all the time, because then, only five years after the introduction of Baltic, White Star Line wanted to construct a trio of liners 45,000 tons and almost 900 feet long. The jump was enormous, and Harland and Wolfe knew it. One of the many enduring myths surrounding Harlan and Wolf, Titanic's builder, is that they cut costs or somehow skimped out on quality, and it's just not true. They were world-class shipbuilders and immensely proud of their product. That, and they took maritime safety extremely seriously. Any incident or disaster at sea could badly damage their reputation, and major shipping companies might be tempted to place orders for their new ships at one of the dozens of other shipbuilding firms around Britain. Harland and Wolf had to prove time and time again that they were the best. This new trio of 45,000 ton superliners would be an excellent opportunity to prove the fact once again, and every single consideration would be taken. This extended from luxurious fittings and interiors, all the way to advanced modern safety features. The new ships would be the absolute best afloat. Contrary to popular belief, the early stages of Titanic's design weren't headed up by Mr. Thomas Andrews. Instead, it was Alexander Carlyle, a veteran naval architect who played a major role in outlining the initial plans for the new ships. Given that the new liners would be double the size of the previous generation of the White Star ships, Carlyle and Harland and Wolfe's design team figured that the number of lifeboats would need to increase considerably. And to help plan the lifeboat accommodations, the company turned to Mr. Axel Wellen, a renowned Swedish inventor and industrialist. Wellen had worked with the Royal Navy on breaches for their cannons, but in the early 1900s he sought to solve another problem. See, warships of the early 1900s had also grown considerably in size, and their hulls featured complicated designs that resulted in decks covered in guns and cluttered equipment. Simply put, it was just too hard to get lifeboats stored high up above the water and far away from the side of the ship, out and over the side. Wellen designed a quadrant davit, which is really a type of crane that could work in pairs to pick up a lifeboat and swing it way out over the side of the ship where it could be filled with people and lowered away. The benefits of his design didn't end there. The davit arms were so tall that two boats could be stacked on top of each other, or a whole second row of boats be stored in board. His patent, filed in 1907, was approved and adopted. And in keeping with their mantra of using only the most modern technology, Harland and Wolfe engaged Wellen to supply the new ships with his fancy new davits, and in May 1910, Wellen weighed in on his proposal for the total number of lifeboats Titanic ought to carry and their placement aboard the ship. All up, Wellen proposed that Titanic carry 32 boats, serviced by 16 pairs of Wellen quadrant davits. One row of boats could be kept along the edge of the boat deck with a second set of boats inboard on the deck as well. The exact placement of the boats, according to Wellen, is kind of the subject of some speculation, but if I had to guess, I would assume he would have suggested keeping the boats in two groups of eight on each side of the ship. A group forward where the officer's promenade was, and a group further aft, around about the region of the second class promenade. 32 large wooden boats would give Olympic and Titanic capacity for about 2,080 people, which was still short of the ship's maximum capacity of about 3,300 people. But hang on a minute, Mike, I can hear you asking, why plan a ship lifeboat capacity for only three quarters of the total complement? Well, this is actually all partly down to a bit of a wide-ranging philosophical discussion on what a lifeboat is actually for. 
See, lifeboats at the time were simple, crude, open-topped wooden boats a little smaller than your average sailing yacht. In any kind of choppy sea, a fully loaded boat would be a perilous proposition. Left to the elements, the occupants would be tossed around and drenched, and more than likely drowned, if the boat tipped over. This actually happened fairly frequently. For example, in 1906, the SS Valencia was wrecked on a reef off Vancouver Island. The ship was stranded in sight of the shoreline less than 90 metres away, but against the captain's orders, six of the ship's seven lifeboats were filled and lowered. Three flipped while being lowered, spilling their occupants into the sea and drowning them. And of the three that survived lowering, two capsized and one just outright disappeared. Only nine men safely made it to shore. In 1904, the SS Clallam, a small 168 foot long steamer, ran into trouble in heavy seas and began taking on water. The ship's captain Roberts ordered women and children into the three lifeboats and lowered them away, but all three either tipped during lowering or capsized, and everybody in the boats was taken by the waves and drowned. By contrast, Clallam, ironically, stayed afloat long enough until the next morning, when a tug came to the rescue, and even though the ship finally eventually capsized and sank, just about all of the 36 people who'd stayed behind and not gone into the lifeboats survived. So history showed that getting into a lifeboat was far from a guarantee for survival. Instead, the emphasis for safety at sea was put into a very different set of safety features and the lifeboats would serve only as the absolute worst case scenario if the other two features did not work out. The first line of defence was the ocean liner itself. Much greater importance was put on watertight subdivisions and providing ways to seal off damaged parts of the ship's hull to slow or stop the flooding. I've gone into Titanic's watertight compartments in more detail in another video, which you might like to watch, but suffice it to say that the ship was designed to kind of be its own lifeboat. Those recent experiences had showed that lowering away small lifeboats into the vast ocean could just as well be a death sentence for those going into them. Instead, the ship had to stay afloat as long as possible and serve as its own life raft. Even if mortally damaged and ultimately doomed, if the ship could stay afloat for a few hours thanks to the watertight compartments, then rescue was a very real possibility. This was thanks to the second line of defence, the Marconi Wireless Telegraph System. When it was introduced, this was an absolute game changer in maritime safety. In the past, ships in distress just had to rely on signal flags, cannons and rockets to hope and pray that another ship might be close enough to see and hear and respond to lend a hand. But by 1909, things had changed dramatically. Many ships now carried the wireless telegraph so they could speak to each other from hundreds of miles away. On top of this, the North Atlantic Ocean was carved into sea lanes, which were basically giant ocean-going highways that meant in any given stretch of the track, there might be up to a half dozen ships within 100 miles of one another. These two huge innovations actually changed the reason for being of the lifeboat itself. Before 1900, lifeboats were the absolute last resort, a Hail Mary in case the ship was close enough to shore to attempt a landing. After the introduction of wireless, however, it was assumed that a sinking ship would fire off a distress call only to find multiple ships rushing to its aid. The new watertight measures would keep the ship afloat long enough so passengers would not have to risk their lives in the dicey lifeboat lowering procedure without cause, as on the SS Clallam. Ships arriving on station would stand to and the lifeboats could then be lowered away, acting as ferries to take loads of passengers from the sinking ship to the rescue ship. To this end, an ocean liner did not need enough lifeboats for all passengers on board because the boats would do multiple trips between the ships and get everybody off safely. It sounded good on paper at least, but in 1909, it was actually proved to be absolutely true. That year, the White Star Line's RMS Republic ran into a fog bank off Nantucket and she was rammed by the SS Florida. Taking on water quickly, Republic sent a wireless distress signal, becoming the first ship to ever actually do so. Shortly afterward, the Florida, which was actually still afloat, the US Coast Guard Cutter Gresham, the RMS Baltic, the RMS Lucania, and the RMS New York all responded and rushed to Republic's aid, arriving on site with enough time to disembark Republic's passengers safely from the ship using its lifeboats. Republic eventually sank, but the only passengers to die did so in the collision and not during the evacuation or after. So with all this in mind, the delicate nature of lifeboats and their susceptibility to the elements, the likelihood of passengers being lost in a panic as lifeboats are launched, as on the Clallam, Valencia and many more, against the powerful nature of the Marconi wireless as a safety measure, and the design of modern ships keeping themselves afloat for long enough to facilitate a rescue, as proved by the Republic disaster, White Star Line and Harland and Wolf regarded Welland's plan and made some alterations. Welland had called for 32 lifeboats, stored in two rows on the boat deck. 
but the Board of Trade Regulations for the day dictated that a ship above 10,000 gross registered tons needed only carry 16 boats, with a minimum capacity of 5,500 cubic feet. Titanic was not 10,000 tons, but a 45,000 ton ship, but the Board of Trade laws were governed by a ship's volume and size, and not its passenger complement. Given that the regulations required Titanic only need carry 16 boats, and that the recent sinking of the RMS Republic proved that lifeboats were useful only really as a ferry between a stricken ship and its rescue ships, White Star and Harland and Wolf removed Welland's second row of lifeboats, essentially halving the number. Titanic would now carry the 16 wooden lifeboats as dictated by the Board of Trade, but to bolster that number, she would also carry four collapsible boats as an additional measure. A move the Board of Trade did not require, and an example of Harland and Wolf and White Star going a step beyond the mere requirements. This decision has been heavily criticised for over a century now, but has also been heavily mythologised. That the decision was made by White Star Chairman J. Bruce Ismay because he just didn't want the decks cluttered with all those lifeboats. Or that the designers actually wanted 64 boats but were overruled at the last minute. Just none of it is true. Ismay never interfered in the planning of safety measures for his ship. Instead of relying just on lifeboats with their chequered history of botched passenger evacuations, the company would instead rely on new technology. The wireless system and the watertight compartments which had been proven in 1909 to work well. Titanic could be its own lifeboat, and if it was ever mortally wounded, it would stay afloat long enough to effect a rescue. So what went wrong? How did the plan, so solidly proven, fall apart that night in April of 1912? Well, for one, the damage to Titanic was just too severe. She was never designed to survive it. We explored this in a previous episode, but the incisions in Titanic's hull made by the iceberg were letting in too much water for its complex, watertight subdivisional system to deal with. The faith and hope that Titanic would stay afloat for long enough to evacuate the ship's passengers to rescue vessels was dashed because they were all just out of reach. Titanic had a little over two hours to live, which is actually a fair amount for a sinking ship, but Carpathia and the others were at least four hours away. If the damage to Titanic had not been so severe, the rescue ships might have arrived on station in time, and the Titanic's lifeboats would have done their job and ferried passengers between the ships. But as it was, Titanic's captain and officers were caught out and realised that without nearby assistance and in freezing cold waters, they would have to rely on the lifeboats as a last ditch measure to evacuate as many of Titanic's passengers as they could, a role for which the lifeboats really just weren't fully intended. When Titanic slipped beneath the waves at about 2.20am that morning, only about 706 people had found a place in the lifeboats and watched on with horror as their ship sank. But what if Titanic did go to sea with the original number of 32 lifeboats? Would it have made an impact on the night and saved more lives? Well, surprisingly, not really. See, I mentioned Titanic only had just over two hours to stay afloat, and the first hour of that time was spent assessing the situation and then getting the lifeboats ready for launching. An efficient passenger evacuation is a time-consuming and difficult process, and Titanic's officers and crew worked like lions, trying to fill and lower their boats. But from the outset, passengers just really weren't that willing. For one, the night was pitch black, and being lowered over the side of a 90-foot drop down into the middle of the freezing Atlantic Ocean just wasn't a very appealing option to many. On top of this, maritime disasters like the Clallam and the Valencia may have been front and centre in many passengers' minds, while the rescue of the Republic may have reassured them that Titanic would stay afloat long enough, so getting into the boats was a bit of a pointless exercise. On top of this, the Welland Davits had to strain to lift and lower the weight of a fully laden lifeboat, which was about five tonnes, and their long arms bounced and jumped as the lifeboat's ropes were let go bit by bit, and the whole thing would have seemed jerky and profoundly unpleasant for those watching. As the end drew near and Titanic's officers and crew were down to their last few remaining boats, it became increasingly more clear that they were just running out of time. By sheer coincidence, Titanic began its final plunge downward at the exact moment officers Murdoch and Lightoller were launching the last two remaining lifeboats, the collapsibles A and B. The situation was so dire that the collapsibles just floated off the ship and they were never actually launched by the Welland Davids. If Titanic still had 16 more lifeboats on board, they would have still been lashed to the well and davits and been dragged under as the ship sank. Each lifeboat had buoyancy tanks installed to aid in flotation, and if they actually provided enough buoyancy, then as Titanic sank lower, some of the lifeboats may have torn free and rocketed to the surface, likely killing or seriously injuring anybody that they impacted. Survivors in the water would then have had to have clung onto the roof of the overturned boat, likely succumbing to the cold during the night. 
maybe a dozen passengers could have survived on top of the boat like that, but the number of those saved by including 16 more lifeboats on Titanic would have been pathetically small and definitely not in the scale of the hundreds of more lives saved that most would expect. There's one interesting postscript to this story. You're probably sitting there safe in the knowledge that passenger ships and cruise ships today must carry enough lifeboat and life raft capacity for 125% of the ship's passengers and crew. But you might be surprised to know that the world's largest and currently only operational ocean liner, the RMS Queen Mary II, has lifeboat capacity for about 3,300 people, but a total maximum crew and passenger capacity of around 3,950 people. Those 650 odd extra people are accounted for by a litany of smaller life rafts and rapid inflating flotation devices, but even today, modern ships' lifeboats need only account for a minimum of three quarters of the ship's passengers and crew, and the rest have to take their chances on the life rafts and the flotation devices. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.